And now, the Lafayette Food Junkie Show, served up medium rare every Sunday night. Welcome back to the Lafayette Food Junkie Show on News Talk 96.5 KPAL. I'm your host, Tiffany Deku. Here we talk about all the food happenings happening around Acadiana. If you like food, tune in. You might learn something new. Welcome back. Uh, great spring weather. I think we are now officially in spring. Uh, my parents are actually in Ohio right now. And my dad was telling me earlier today that they were having a beautiful day. It was in the 40s. And they're supposed to get snow again next week. Uh, we we kind of forget <laughs> that in other areas of the country, it is still snowing right now. I don't I don't know. Like I wish this weather would stay. Like this is my absolute favorite weather. And then in fall, before it gets like stupid hot. Like I don't I don't know about you, Mark. No, not a, not a fan of this weather. I I would prefer it to just be really cold. All the time. Okay. See. Um, I do kind of like the cold, so you should be in Ohio, is what you're saying. Yeah, you need to move. <laughs> so I don't want, I don't, I don't want to be hot. I don't like to be sweaty. You can yeah. put on more clothes. This is true. And what was very confusing about this past week too, it was like you would leave during the day and it was cold. And then by the time you got off of work, it was like 80 degrees. Yeah. So it was like you would leave with a sweater. And then at the end of the day, you're like, why did I bring the sweater to work? Changing into shorts in the middle of yeah. the day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, so we're going to be talking different food topics tonight. Mark Whitney was in the food industry, has retired. Um, but if you follow him on Instagram, he's taking beautiful food photography. He's laughing and cringing at that. Um, you can stop because they are beautiful pictures. You're like also cooking a lot of cool things at home. You're doing different things with liqueurs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I saw something about some homemade whiskey. Uh, was from... A friend of the family. Okay. So it was a birthday present. Yeah. How was um, it? It was really good, actually. Ooh. The guy supposedly has been doing it for 30-something years. Uh, it's a guy out of parks. Okay. And so went home last night for a birthday party, and my brother procured a couple of bottles. And so we got to kind of pass it around and have I, a good night. I was wondering so, how it was going to taste. Like, It's I really was... good. It doesn't taste like... I've had mash before uh -huh. where it is essentially white lightning. And that's what I was expecting. Stuff, it, it, it was really smooth. It reminded me a lot of Jameson. Had a little bit of sweetness to it. Had a little bit of that kind of corn mash feel to it. Um, but definitely didn't have a bite. Didn't have a burn. Wasn't peaty. Um, supposedly he ages it out in big old plastic tubs. Oh. And seals it up. Keeps it sealed with a hammer and weights them down with cement blocks where nothing gets into them. So, like, he's really careful. He's not. Wow. But is probably not um, licensed. Yeah, I'm sure. So, uh, but it was really good. It was it was surprisingly good that we pretty much almost finished the bottle. I got so. homemade muscadine wine for Christmas from my uncle, and I haven't tried it yet because it's, I don't, like, I can't drink an entire bottle of yeah. wine. And needless to say, homemade wine, because um, I don't know what it's going to be like. Uh, so I'm kind of like waiting until I'm going camping in a few weeks. And I think I'm going to bring it and we're going to check it out to see. But I, I like the homemade yeah. stuff. I mean, it's not it's nice. all terrible. <laughs> and a lot, I mean, especially I've had some really great moonshine mm -hmm. from around here. Apple cinnamon, yeah. actually moonshine from around here. So if you know, if you know people, <laughs> you can kind of find, I was just really curious about the whiskey. Yeah, well, and that's the thing is that, you know, there's obviously a really fine line. There's some, uh, some definite safety concerns when it comes to actual homemade liquor and not liqueur. Mm -hmm. um, whiskey, one step away, can kill somebody. So it's yeah. pretty risky to say like, hey, I made a whiskey. Please drink it. Yeah. If my brother had not said that this guy had been doing it for 30 years and had not killed anyone yet, probably wouldn't have tried it. Right. Um, but knowing that you've been around that long and you haven't been labeled a serial killer pretty much means <laughs> that you're... A okay in my book. What was the so, most recent thing that you made at home that turned out well and you were kind of impressed by? Would have probably been actually so a couple of weeks ago was my birthday. Mm -hmm. It was also Pi Day. Oh yeah, we need to talk about yeah. that. So uh I made a dozen pies 
uh, was supposed to be 120 hand pies, but that fell out for some you quickly dough. oh quickly yeah. realized that was a that was a lot but had, a, more than had a small hiccup chew. with with the dough recipe and had to adjust after ruining a bunch of batches um and so made some adjustments had some help and ended up cranking out a dozen pies at seven o'clock in the morning on the 14th wow um and so went through that and then gave them away downtown to just whoever passed by so we had some homeless people that came by we had some friends we had some family um, it was a, it was a pretty fun day. We just set up in front of Chris, Chris son's place, the mm-hmm. barbershop, um, and had a little table, like a lemonade stand and just served pies, out. had some local artists, had Aileen Bennett and uh, Jackie Perry do some art for him. So like some cool little cards. So kind of tried to theme it up a little bit yeah. and have some fun with it. So it was really, it turned out a lot better than I was expecting it to. So is this so, going to be like a yearly tradition now? Maybe we'll see. <laughs> Um, if I do it again next year, it'll be a little different and I'll have some more help. Yeah. So um, I'll also do it earlier. Where, did you do all these pies at home? No. So I started at home. I did most of the preserves and everything. Um, and then Zach McMath at the food hub mm-hmm. let me use out his kitchen for a night. Okay. Well, that was nice. So yeah, it was super it nice. Quicker. Of him. So I gave him a box of pies and that was pretty much my payment, which is great. Um, but it was really cool to actually, it's been a long time since I've been in a commercial kitchen. Um, I'd say probably now almost five or six years. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was, I, I really missed cooking in quantities like that. Um, I remember having really good conversations in kitchens before where the idea of cooking is essentially that you, you love people mm-hmm. and you want to feed them. And so this was a good like kind of visit to that because I, I didn't make any money on it. I didn't right. sell them. I didn't. It was purely just to kind of spread some good on my birthday. Did so, you sell out of yeah, sell out of in like the an pies. hour and a half. Oh wow! So um, we had enough people walking by. There were some people from CGI across that walked over. Uh, the judge from the bankruptcy court <laughs> sent his two security guards nice. to come and pick up boxes. Um, had some people inside who were getting haircuts who we handed out to. Uh, Colin Cormier from Get a pie Tops with came a in. <laughs> yeah, so got to kind of share it around with. Some people that I really enjoy spending time with and then some complete strangers. Nice. So it was good. That is a great way to spend your birthday. It was weird, but it was <laughs> nice. So it's not because, I mean, it wasn't a party. It wasn't yeah. anything. But doing weird stuff on my birthday is kind of normal. So it's either take off and go on a random camping trip or give away pies, I guess. So What were the flavors of the pies? Uh, so I did a uh, sweet potato and chai with some uh, candy pecans and then did... Um, a blackberry and lemon curd and made what's called sugar glass. Mm -hmm. And so I made a mint sugar glass. Wow. And so we broke it up and then kind of plated the pieces on top of the blackberry pie so that some of the mint then kind of soaked into the crust. And so you got a little bit of kind of that effervescence whenever you took a bite. So, and then you could also chew on the glass like candy. So it's kind of just a little extra fun piece. I'd always wanted to make sugar glass. So it was a really good experience. Now now you got to do it. So... Have you thought about going into the pie business? Never. No. Nope. No. Just a just a fun once yeah. a year birthday I thing. Mean, when you're born on pie day and your mom's a math teacher, you always get birthday pies. Right. And so it kind of just became a normal thing. Mm-hmm. Um I I do I love desserts, but I'm definitely more of a cook than a baker. Um so if I did anything, it would be a cafe with a coffee shop than it would be a, a pastry shop. So yeah. All right. Well, we are going to take our first break. And when we come back, we have more with Mark Whitney. So come back to us. It is the Lafayette Food Junkie Show on News Talk 96.5 KPL. It's hard to believe. And now we talk about food. It's the Lafayette Food Junkie Show on News Talk 96.5 KPL. Welcome back to the Lafayette Food Junkie Show on News Talk 96.5 KPL. I'm your host, Tiffany Deku, and we are talking with Mark Whitney tonight. Uh, we just wrapped up talking about pies. Now we're going to talk about the David Chang Netflix show, Ugly Delicious. So have you, I've only seen the first two episodes. Have you seen the entire series? Yeah, I'm going through the whole thing. Okay. So um, I do know that they have an upcoming episode where he's in New Orleans. Yeah. Um, and is it, I'm just asking you, because. To kind of get a preview, is it like a a jumbling of of 
New Orleans and Cajun culture like so many travel shows do. Well, so what's really nice is that they go more into Viet Cajun. Oh, okay. It's a pretty that's right. Um, big. Yes. Topic. Um, and so that's actually a very awesome episode. Okay. So well, he that, goes to New I Orleans, to Houston, and to Vietnam. Okay. And talks to people who used to live Mal Crawfish in style, South Louisiana. Uh, Vietnamese style crawfish. Well, and not even just Vietnamese style crawfish, but there's a lady who learned how to make Cajun food and then moved to Vietnam. Yes. And opened up a Viet Cajun restaurant. Yes. And so she was on the episode of. Oh, man. It's like the Everybody Loves Raymond guy. I can't remember what the name. It's like somebody feed Phil or something oh, um, like that. Everyone feed Phil. Everyone feed like Phil that. or something yeah. like that. I think she that, she's on okay. that episode. Um, but I've I've seen yeah, her yeah, restaurant right. before, too. OK, cool. Then yeah. I'm excited so good, about it's not it's not drowning you in Cajun food and mass. Mm-hmm. It's talking about a subset of people who are very underappreciated around here and the delicious food that they make. Yeah. So. Well, okay. So I, so we've talked about this on the show before, like Vietnamese style crawfish is more popular in new uh, Houston yeah. than it is here, but it's starting to come to Lafayette and there, and it's also starting to come to new Orleans New Orleans and people in Lafayette kind of have the same reaction. They're like, this is not crawfish. But I have an appreciation for people that can take something that is and make it their own well, kind of thing. That's how recipes are born. Yes. I mean, we all love crawfish and we all love gumbo and we all love etouffee, but all of those dishes started as something else. You know, we took a recipe that we liked we took something for a cubion that we liked and we created a dish that was uniquely Cajun. I mean, that's how it works. And honestly, I'm going to get some heat for this, but that's also why I don't get so upset when people come out with random gumbo recipes no, because be. yes, it is not of your culture, but somebody is like seeing something in it that they're appreciating and trying to make their own. And I, and I get it and I get the cringeworthy factor too, but you have to also like look at it from a different perspective. Well, authenticity in food is incredibly overrated. Yeah. Uh, my favorite ramen shop is run by a Jewish guy in Brooklyn. And so that's not what you expect from world-class ramen, but he's won awards for it from James Beard. He's, done a lot of great work and now has multiple restaurants open that are all doing the same thing. It's not as long as you pay respect to the food that you're using, that's all that matters. Like if you understand that you didn't invent ramen or crawfish or gumbo. Right. That it is definitely a culture of people that you can understand, then you can make it your own and have some riffs and twists on it. I mean, I don't think you should not be allowed to make Asian food because you're not Asian. Right. But you should also understand that it is not your food. And you have to also understand that, like, a lot of these foods overlap. Like, in the taco episode of it, and I kind of knew this, but then they kind of talked about it. And that's what I love about the episodes is that it kind of, like, takes the dish where it started, the different versions of where it's gone throughout history, the commercial commercialized yeah. version of it as well, and then kind of, like, it's telling the story from all different angles from it. And, and that's not necessarily saying which one is right, but this is, like, what that different perspective is, is yeah. from. And in the... Taco episode, especially, they were talking about um, Taco's Pastor, which if, you, if you're not familiar with it, it's typically on a um, vertical skewer. There's a pineapple on top, and they're slicing it like shawarma. Yeah. Well, I didn't know that in Mexico, when this became popular, there was a huge influx of Lebanese that brought shawarma, oh. and so they incorporated it and made it pastor and then you get the tacos pastor you know tacos that are now ingrained in spanish and mexican culture right and will always be yeah i mean it's one of probably i would say it is probably one of the most popular dishes that they brought here mm -hmm. more than anything else i mean that's and that's when i get super excited and get my like i get so like food geekery about it is like seeing the history and progression of a dish and like and where it came from and like where it is now and like the different kinds of things for, like that. And that's like a prime example of it. You can see it in the Vietnamese style crawfish. You can see it in other dishes. I mean, look at ramen and how it is a Japanese dish, 
but there's southern versions of it now that have wild boar and collard greens in it. And it's, I mean, it's not traditional ramen, but it is a southern version of ramen and just as delicious. The first time I went to Chicago, there's a restaurant called Avec there. And I think maybe we've talked about it before, but there was snail boudin. And so it was boudin that was made with a white wine risotto. So it had rice in it and then had snails and livers. And so, I mean, for all intents and purposes, it's boudin. Right. And it has the primary ingredients of what make boudin. It was in casing. It was in pig casing, which you don't get much of around here anymore. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, other than the fact that it was not made with a traditional meat or just regular white rice that's popped into a pot, it was boudin. I mean, it's not, but it was their version of it. It was something that they were doing that was a little different because to sit there and I almost think it's more of a disrespect to take the original version of that dish and throw it everywhere. Mm-hmm. Like I think if you're in a place like New York or Chicago and you're not running a Cajun restaurant and you are making gumbo, like as we know gumbo and saying that like it's a Southern authentic thing, that's weirder to me. Mm-hmm. So I think just make your own. Like don't worry about. But what if it's somebody from South Louisiana that moves to New York? That's fine. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, I'm, it doesn't even have to be that. It can be some brummy from the Bronx who is making it. I mean, it's not just do it right. Mm-hmm. And I guess that's kind of that becomes really hard. Like you can't really find andouille sausage in New York. You can't right. really find tasso. Oh, in New York. my dad can you tell know. you from his travels how hard it is to find good sausage. And so if you're gonna sit there and use like a kielbasa and some other random part of a pig, like that's cool, but then that's not gumbo. That's a different style of gumbo and so that's kind of just where it becomes a little more difficult if you have all the normal ingredients for that recipe go for it call it gumbo call it whatever you want but just make something different that has kind of the same name right okay so i want to specifically talk about the pizza episode because it's going to bring us into our next topic so on the pizza episode they kind of talked about how pizza was created in italy by italians perfected by Italian Americans and became American. And I had to wholeheartedly kind of agree with that. And they were kind of arguing the point that American style pizza is better now than Italian pizza. I think that's a matter of perspective. Um, But like they even on the episode, I felt so bad for that guy because he was like so insulted. But they had a, a... pizza maker who was doing Neapolitan style pizza and they ordered Domino's and he was just like, no, (laughs) like, no. And David Chang was like, like Domino's has good pizza. And yeah, so it was even just talking to whenever David Chang goes out to deliver with the Domino's guy and he is wholeheartedly in belief that they make the best pizza. Yeah. And David Chang is in disbelief that like, that is what you consider to be the best pizza. I mean, my mom, I love her to death, but her favorite hamburger is from Sonic. Mm-hmm. Like, it doesn't matter where I bring her. It doesn't matter. So she wants I a Sonic hamburger. She wants a good old-fashioned Sonic hamburger. And there's nothing wrong with that. But it's weird. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's just, I at no point would I ever consider anything that is that quickly and massively produced to be the best thing ever. So I kind of feel like, There is not all pizza is created equal, but most pizza is good pizza. Yeah, it's really hard to pizza. And I kind of like the the kind of thing that I kind of throw out is most frozen varieties that you can get at a supermarket, although you can find some some good frozen frozen ones. ones. Um, You know, Target brand has like an amazing one. But I kind of can tell you what I like about almost any pizza place. I am not a fan of Domino's, though. I'm a Pizza Hut fan when it comes to that different sauces and then little caesars actually because it's five bucks you know so like i you know i can appreciate all all pizza because something about it is delicious and what i'm wanting at the time it's quick it's easy unless you're making it yourself but it's incredibly difficult and it's painstaking and (laughs) takes a lot of time but i mean there's definitely like a there's a benefit to price 
ratio going on there where the five dollar pizza is perfectly fine because it's five bucks and you get it in two minutes right you can like walk in and get it and yeah. come out with it and so it's, it's nice and plus the crazy bread is amazing <laughs> but then at that point too there's i'm never going to walk up to someone and said like man dude, you got to try that little caesar right, like, right i'm never gonna do that <laughs> i'll say like hey do you have no money is it rent week yeah there's a little caesar's down the road right if you have quarters right go buy a pizza in quarters or just saying dollar seventy five Costco slices. <laughs> we were talking about that yeah. before the show. That are like literally the size of your head. Like it's you can get pizza by the slice you there. Have gas to make it there. Yeah, <laughs> you can do okay. Or if you have a membership, you can get your gas there. There you go. See, double <laughs> and it's up. Cheap gas. <laughs> the mini wanders of Costco. <laughs> All right, we are going to take a break and we're going to talk more pizza. So come back to us. It is the Lafayette Food Junkie Show on News Talk ninety six five KPL. The best tasting radio show in all of South Louisiana. It's the Lafayette Food Junkie Show on News Talk 96.5 KPL. Welcome back to the Lafayette Food Junkie Show on News Talk 96.5 KPL. I'm your host, Tiffany Deku, and we've been talking with Mark Whitney tonight. We're going to continue our discussion on pizza, and we're going to talk about the newest pizza place that opened up, Central, that has been getting rave reviews. I know you're a fan. You yep. went early on, uh, so tell me about your experience there. It was really good. We went um, one of the days of the soft opening, so the weekend before kind of the big mm-hmm. un- unveil, I guess. Um, it was good. The service was quick. We were surprised that there wasn't much of a wait. Um, I don't know if that means that they're just getting people in and out. It was because it was a soft opening. I guess, but it was still pretty. <laughs> right. I mean, it's downtown. Like having, and it was downtown during Art Walk. Oh. And during what, Patty, it was on St. Patty's Surprise! Day kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. So you can't really, it's not a soft opening. Um, we sat down pretty quick. We got the service that we expect from a decent restaurant. Right. Um, appetizers were great. Drinks were good. Pizza was excellent. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to have another really good pizza place a little bit closer to my house. Um, I'm also very scared to have <laughs> a pizza so place close. so close to my house. <laughs> so tell us about the wings because you kind of went on and on and they were good. about the wings. Um, sticky, sweet, spicy. Were they breaded? No. Okay. No, they're not breaded. Okay. Um, definitely a good size. Low carb then. <laughs> and covered in like pistachios and scallions. Mm. They were really good. Um, all of the appetizers that we tried were great. Uh, the leek and bacon dip was good. The pita bread that they served it on was essentially like a piece of their dough that they cut out. Yes. Um, that's my favorite. It was. Ooh. It was good. And the pizzas we got were both great. Mm-hmm. So you got a pineapple pizza, pineapple pizza, with controversial some and some chicken thighs on it. Yeah. So it was really good. It was a red sauce. Uh, we got a white sauce pizza as well called the Eleanor. Um, that one was a little bit more kind of classic Neapolitan style without, I guess, being Neapolitan. Neapolitan. Yeah. Um, and then we also took home a margarita pizza for a friend. And she said it was probably one of the best margarita pizzas she's had. Wow. So they have, I think it's called the curly stew. First off, I love that they have curly pepperonis yeah, on the curly pizzas. Curly peps. Curly peps. So the curly stew is like a white pizza and it has the pepperoni and I think it has like pine nuts and some other stuff on it, but it looks really good. We went yesterday um, in the afternoon kind of just to chill out and. I love that the windows open and it's kind of like a double sided bar. So like on one side, you're in the restaurant on the other side, you're outside of the restaurant. So we sat in one of the windows and we kind of just had appetizers and cocktails and we got pizza by the slice. So I tried the pepperoni pizza. uh, Cocktails were delicious. So if you miss the cocktails from Dark Rue, um, Paige Tate is is doing the cocktails there also there's a bartender from pamplona that's there too so they have a really great cocktail selection going on really good selection period good wines good whiskeys Mm -hmm. uh i've been told they have a really good beer selection but i didn't experience it i didn't really look at the at the beer because i'm 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 always like just do you have sour okay no then i don't care yeah um but they had i had asked the server because it was uh, i think it was called go baroque 
um, was one of the drinks. And that's the one that I got and had tequila at St. Germain. And I think it had like grapefruit bitters and some other things in it. And then straight out of Central. Nice. And I was like, which one should I get? And she was like, do you like Negroni? And I said, no, I hate Negroni. (laughs) She was like, don't get straight out of Central because it has the uh, Apertol Apertol in it. So I was like, no. So I got it. Delicious. Had a margarita as well. Um, the My friend that went with me got the Afternoon Delight, which was like almost like a daiquiri. Um, it was it was really nice. Like it was it was very it had like a lot of whipped cream <laughs> on it. All right. Um, but it looked delicious. I remember seeing pictures of that one. It's kind of red and layered, yes, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So she got that and there it was just really nice to be like the weather was good. I love the ambiance in there. It's a great looking sh- location. It's gonna be a good for like a first date or kind of like just in the afternoon, wanting to go have some drinks with your friends. Like, and I feel like that's... I want to say they're open until 1 o'clock in the morning. But they're not... So the bar, the bar closes bar at 11. Uh, no, sorry, the kitchen closes y- at 11. The yes. bar stays open until 1. And that's something that I thought the kitchen was going to be open that long, and they're not. So probably the kitchen closes early. That may change. I imagine it'd probably be pretty hard to find somebody to sling pizzas until 1 o'clock in the morning who is not Manny Ojello. Right. So. <laughs> Do you know how much money they would make if they did pizza that late yeah, I think it'd be being great. downtown like especially because we don't have a lot of there's food, not a food, food options downtown, downtown. Yeah. jsp i think is it and they close at midnight right? i know that a lot of food trucks have now started going back downtown for that specific reason yeah. um but god they would make a killing but it was nice appetizers we got were fabulous i got the cheese curds delicious the brussels sprouts i just want to take a minute and talk about them um Bacon and and tart cherry. So the salty and the sour from the cherry was just everything. And then there's this little like chili aioli go- thing going on okay, too. Okay. Um, if you're doing like the low carbish thing like I was, like I wasn't supposed to have cocktails or pizza yesterday, but <laughs> well, we we just threw that out the window. Cheat meals. Brussels sprouts, low carbish because I'm sure the aioli has some sugar in it. Probably. And then the cherries as well. But delicious. And yeah, we had the pizza, and so it was. It was really nice. Like I'm, li- I'm glad that we have a second kind of gourmet pizza yeah, yeah. place. It's not the same style of pizza as Bread and Circus. It's not. So let's clarify that Bread and Circus style is classic Neapolitan style pizza. It's more about the crust. Central's gonna be more about the toppings. Yeah. I feel, although the the crust is good too. It's yeah, like the crust real is good. thin. Yeah. yeah, it's thin. It's still wood fired. Um, they're just not as religious about it yeah and so manny it's definitely the has church the of church pizza. of pizza <laughs> yeah uh whereas central is definitely just kind of your good it reminds me a lot of kind of bigger city pizza shops mm-hmm. whereas manny just and that's the kind of restaurant. feel that it had yeah. it had in too like i felt like i was in a new york pizzeria yeah. so it's hang not- out get a drink get a slice talk to some people and then leave i have to say i'm very excited that we're having some more locally owned restaurants opening up now and it's and it's kind of like we're having like a little mini boom because we have a lot that's that's coming or in the works or has just opened so it's kind of exciting to see that start happening in back in town cuz you know we were kind of in a slump we had a lot of chain restaurants coming with the Costco development so people were really worried we had a lot of restaurants that closed so 40 something sushi restaurants that have opened up in the last five years. I was talking about this the other day that where my apartment is, I have at least five sushi restaurants in walking distance. And I don't understand <laughs> why someone's like, yep, sushi, let's open another one. But with two more opening, someone up argued, though, that there's people in all of them. So uh, sure, they must be making business. And if we had less, then maybe our favorite res- our favorite sushi restaurant would be busier because everyone has a favorite. I mean, I'm fine with that, though, because none of it. I don't think I've ever like walked into a sushi restaurant around here. And a none of them are my favorite. B, I've never had to sit down for a wait. Like, I don't think I I've have. ever been on a waiting list for a, unless it's tsunami down. Yeah, tsunami. That's the only, but they're always they are always full and it's usually not for the food. Yeah, that's like, like a social scene. Yeah, you're downtown to hang out and get some That cocktails. was like my gateway drug to sushi, though. Like, was Tsunami. It's a great place. Yeah, because Tsunami, yeah. Tsunami brought sushi to Lafayette. Like, there's the one who started it, and look what they've created. Yeah. We now have a sushi restaurant for every citizen of 
Acadiana yeah. to dine at. You could all have a personal sushi restaurant. And then now we're getting the all you can eat places too that are coming in. Um, cause with Sushi Masa coming, that's going to make like six now yeah. that are within walking distance from my apartment. And then there's that one that opened up on, uh, Pinhook and Ambassador. No, sorry. Kali Saloon and Ambassador. Oh, Wasabi. Yeah, yes. That's also an all you can eat. Mm-hmm. I've been to that one. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. I feel like, can we please get a dim sum restaurant? <laughs> Something, or just a really good ramen shop. That that's is in, been the ar- that's been the argument too. You okay? So let me ask you because you just mentioned that because yeah. you've had the ramen at Rouse's yeah. and I still have not had it yet. It's it's the best ramen you'll find in town, which isn't saying much. Did but you it's have cheap it? And it's pretty delicious at Shangri La. Yeah, I liked it at Shangri La. It was fine. I didn't like their pork. Oh, see, the so. one that I had was like a. I, they only had one option and it was like, I think a seafood oh, okay. at the time. Cause there was like a lot of those, like, I don't know what it is, but it's like white and it has like a pink circle. It's oh, some uh, kind of fish. Yeah. They yeah. had that in it. Fish cakes. And it smelled awful because it was the bone broth. Um, but it tasted delicious. Like the broth was so good. Well, so that's the best one yeah. that I had had in Lafayette. The one in Rouse's is good. The guy who makes it is very, very attentive to detail. They make their own noodles there, from what I've been told. Wow. The broth is made every morning um, and rolls over. So whatever I think they made yesterday is the broth for the next day. Okay. Because um, it takes a while for it's, it to cook. And through. everything so, is better the next day. And it's From what I've been told by friends of mine that I trust a lot with ramen, it's a very traditional tunkotsu, um, which is great. So you won't find – the closest thing you'll find to that is either going to be Baton Rouge or all the way in Austin and Houston. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and it's New, good. New Orleans is starting to get some ramen Couple, yeah, places. There's Noodle and Pie that um, are opening. There's another one that opened up as well, but Noodle and Pie is good. Um, they do ramen and pho and pies. It's a weird combination. <laughs> nice combination. But it works pretty well. So kind of a punk rock vibe to it. So okay, yeah. All right. Well, we are going to take another break, and when we come back, we have more with Mark. So come back to us. It is the Lafayette Food Junkie Show on News Talk ninety six five KPL. From Boudin to the best burgers Acadiana has to offer, it's the Lafayette Food Junkie Show on News Talk 96.5 KPEL. Welcome back to the Lafayette Food Junkie Show on News Talk 96.5 KPL. I'm your host, Tiffany Deku, and we've been talking with Mark Whitney tonight. So I am doing Food Junkie Fridays on the KPL Morning Show now on Fridays. It'll be about the 7.40 a.m. segment. And this past Friday was my inaugural visit. And we talked about the pickle slush, slushy, icy. It's a slush. I worked at Sonic, and that's sad that I don't remember what it is officially called, but the pickle slushy uh, that Sonic is going to be debuting this summer, and we kind of talked about the history of, like, why this is even a thing, and we didn't have enough time to talk about why I thought it was a bad idea. Uh, What are your thoughts on pickle drinks? The only thing I've ever had that I haven't hated is a pickleback. That's what I, that was one of the things that I talked about on the show. That's about it. Um, other than that, I mean, I love pickles and I love pickled goods, but I don't want to drink brine. I just don't. So we talked about that the history of that and why it's even a thing is because like back in the day, if water was scarce, people would drink vinegar, vinegar based drinks called shrubs and it, it would typically have fruit or flowers or herbs or something in it. And it was way more refreshing for you than just actual water. And it had more electrolytes and it was better for you. We even talked about how in the sports industry, like they'll drink pickle juice again yeah. for the electrolytes. So that's why it's even a thing. And like, so that's why made a really big. Yes. Resurgence in cocktails and, and that's, like that. yeah, we so. discussed that on the show. In fact, speaking of central, they have a honey shrub um, on, on their menu yeah. right now too. So a lot of like the better quality bar menus in town if you see a shrub that's what it is it's a vinegar based drink and it's delicious in a cocktail don't know how refreshing and will keep you hydrated combining it with alcohol necessarily is but counterbalance maybe. yeah it's it's a good it's a good thing now i worked at sonic from when i was 16 to when i graduated college 
And I was a car hop. And so part of what we did was we made the soft serve ice cream. We made slushies and we made the soft drinks. Okay. So to this day, I can't have slushies or soft serve from there because going home at the end of the night, being like covered and soft serve and sticky saw and slushy stuff and just smelling gross, like old yeah. milk. And just, I can't, I can't do it anymore. Like I watch me go to a buffet though and make an ice cream cone. Cause then you can tell what I used to do <laughs> for a living, but uh can't do it anymore. So w- we were talking about, I actually, one of my former coworkers at Sonic who lives in Houston now, had sent me the article about the pickle slushy and she was talking about how it was a bad idea. Cause she was like, can you imagine at the end of the night having to clean the slushy machine that has like already the sticky sugariness, but is also going to have that pickle vinegary smell to it from all day. Yeah. And I feel so bad for those employees. Now, the redeeming quality is I feel like there's probably not going to be an ounce of actual pickle juice in it. And it's all going to be man-made. And I'm wondering if they're going to focus more on the sweet aspect of the pickle versus the sour. Like, I feel like it's not like the vinegar is not going to be there. I feel like it's going to be like a sour, little sour, way more on the sugar. I think, I mean, you almost have to have a little bit of that vinegar though, because if not, it's not a pickle. Yeah. And so I think at that point, it's a weird... Then you just have cucumber water. You know what this means? Let, that I'm going to have to go and actually taste this thing. Yeah, you can, you <laughs> to give like an informative <laughs> opinion on it. Happily pass. I'll get a kitty size. There you go. Get a, I'm like, get can a I thimble. just get a taster of it? Like, can I just actually... Because that's the thing too. Like the actual slush is just like simple syrup. Yeah. So it's like sugar. So it's like... Is it that going to be the sugar and this is just going to be like a sour that's added to it or, or, Probably so. or what? It's going to be some sort of powdered sour vinegar mix. Well, because the slush, the like the actual syrups are like simple syrup too. And you like pump that in yeah. there, but it's like almost, it's like high fructose corn syrup bubble gum and ocean water, and, you know, and all the crazy flavors. Like the only thing that was like, wow, I just remember this. So our lemon and lime slushies were actually made with actual lemons and And limes. And the cherry limeade is too, right? Yes. So, well, like the cherries are in syrup. It's that syrup that the cherries are in. So maybe they are going to have actual pickle juice in it. And that makes me feel even even weirder about it. A container, a Cajun chef. They just (laughs) ladle out of it. Yeah. So I'm going to have to check that out. You know what? What if they're using the pickle juice from the pickles that they do make the hamburgers with? I mean, they probably have a bunch of leftovers. Which I then it, then I can kind of appreciate it from a different perspective in that that's not food waste. Yeah, sure. They're not <laughs> throwing it down a drain somewhere. Exactly. It's like you're repurposing that pickle juice. Yeah. Uh, we're, I'm going to have to investigate this. Sadly, my job takes me places I don't want to go sometimes. Have fun. Like Boudin in North Louisiana, but um, you I, know you have to do it to try. A million links of North Louisiana Boudin before I would ever drink a pickle slush. Wow! So, but you were brave, a snail Boudin. I would have never done that. Yeah, <laughs> I would have never. The guy done was that. excited to let me try it. Like because once he you were knew from that here. I was, yeah, yeah. And so I was more than happy to eat a free link of Boudin whenever I, it's not raw. Right. So <laughs> is it raw? No. Okay. No. I'll yeah, try we're good. It. Okay. Yeah, we're you good. won't kill me. It's fine. So next Sunday is Easter, and we're not going to be on the air. Um, we're going to take the Sunday off, and we're going to talk about Easter foods really quickly. So what do you? What does your family typically do for Easter? Usually crawfish etouffee. Okay. So that, maybe a ham, depending on how many people show up. But it's it's pretty, pretty Cajun. So it'll be an etouffee with some green beans and some bread and maybe a potato salad if my mom's feeling fancy. Yeah. So I'm yeah. kind of not down for celebrating Easter this year because Easter was like the worst Easter imaginable last year. Uh, we did have, I did eat some delicious food, but it was just a really bad day. Yeah. So uh, I'm kind of like boycotting Easter, but I kind of want to cook. And growing up, we did brisket. And my dad would put, um, we would like poke a bunch of holes in it and he would shove 
cloves of garlic. And I feel like he put some kind of seasoning. It was probably like Tony's or something like that. And then we would just cook it all day in the oven until it was like fall apart. And then we would do like scalloped potatoes to go with it. So I'm kind of like feeling that. Like I want to do that. Scalloped potatoes, green beans. Got to try to balance it to make make it seem like it's healthy. Yeah. Yeah. And then I kind of, I'm kind of feeling like a, a strawberry cheesecake pie. I saw, I saw this recipe um, and I have a, a bunch of frozen strawberries in the freezer. So I can kind of use that. Yeah. That's, that's kind of what I'm feeling. Don't know if it's actually going to happen. Trying to see if I can get like an orphan Easter thing going. Otherwise, I'm not going to do anything. And I'll just sit in bed and watch Netflix and go to the store and get peanut butter. Reese's peanut butter eggs, which is the best part of Easter. Reese's peanut butter eggs and jelly bellies. Even though Jello Bellies is served all year, it's still just, it's it's my Easter treat. I like so. the jelly beans that are, uh, the, the sweet tart jelly Those beans that they and make the now. Ones. Yeah, the sour. I like the, the sour in it. But man, it's all about the peanut butter eggs for me. And it's like, it literally tastes better than an actual, like a regular And it shouldn't because Reese's. it's literally the exact same thing. But, but there's something about it's it. It's the shape and it's thicker. Yes. It's actually like two... Reese's peanut butter cups. You don't have that hard ridge around it. And I'm weird in that I like to eat all the chocolate off of it and then eat my peanut butter separately. So I get to eat like that whole entire like peanut butter sure. thing, which again, they make a Reese's peanut butter that you can buy that does not taste like it does in the candy. That's weird. Um, it's not the same. So don't even oh, do any try. But I think that that's why it tastes better. And they make them now for all of the different holidays. Still doesn't taste as good as the Easter's version. <laughs> something about that egg shape. It's something. But if you think about it, it is. It's like two peanut butter cups yeah, see that. in one. And then it doesn't have the hard ridge around the top of a little it. Little more peanut butter, a little less shell. Yes. And the peanut. I'm all about the peanut butter for that. That's That's actually my favorite part of it. <laughs> <laughs> the anatomy of a Reese's peanut butter egg. Someone's going to eventually dissect. Yeah. And just have a poster. Of and it. see that I'm right. So, okay. So the other thing that I used to like is the malted. It was like Whopper eggs, but they weren't Whopper brand. It was like malted egg. Like Robin eggs. eggs? Are you talking about those? Yeah. Like yeah. Robin. Okay. So they have a version that's like solid chocolate. These were like malted. Okay. And they had like a thin layer of. Of, of chocolate. But what was nice about them is that if you lick them, the dye would come off and you like the little girls like me and like the other girls would put it as lipstick. So we would have like pink lipstick and blue lipstick and purple. And we'd like put it all out. Like it was like makeup for us by just licking this thing and like all the dye would come off and it would be all over your hands. So fun, fun uh-huh. Easter uh-huh. memory. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, it's just. I mean, hey, what are you gonna do when you're when you're a kid? Like, you know, it's it's the fun Easter memories. So, do, do y'all do egg pocking? We did. Yeah, mm-hmm. we don't so much anymore. If we get a good showing of like nieces and nephews, we will. Um, but mostly, it's dying and hiding. It's always been kind of the. We'll do a little Easter egg hunt, and that's about as far as we go. So, being from North Louisiana, we didn't really egg pock. My great grandmother did. Like, because I remember when she was alive, we would do the egg pocking with her, but it wasn't really carried out in the rest of the family. And then when we were living in Texas, you would take the eggs, you would get all the yolk out, and you would put confetti in it. Like, they would still be decorated, and so you'd tape up back the bottom. And then when people would walk through the door, you would smash the ha- the oh, egg over okay. their head and, like, have the confetti. Like, that's actually, like, a, a, right. a Hispanic... Easter tradition because it's very common in in Texas to do that. So that's something that we used to do as a kid as well. I actually like that tradition better than the egg pocking. (laughs) Seems like it'd be a little bit more fun to smash an egg in somebody's face. Yeah, just be like, happy Easter! high five two together (laughs) and they blow up. All right. Mark, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's been a pleasure. All right. That's our show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Join us next week, Sunday at 6 p.m. This is Tiffany Deku on News Talk 96.5 KPL. And this is the Lafayette Food Junkie Show. Thanks for listening. And as always, happy eating, Acadiana.